Welcome, Sue. Thank you. So great to meet you. Really excited to talk to you. We were just talking a little bit actually before we started recording um, because in preparation for the interview, I've been listening to other interviews of yours and kind of learning about your work. And I told you that I noticed that there were a lot of parallels, it seemed to me at least, um, between recovery and a lot of the work that you do. And it turns out <laughs> that that's not a coincidence. So maybe to start, we can talk about you know, a little bit about what you do, of course, and also why you got into psychiatry. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for watching the videos. Um, sometimes when I put them out, I'm like, is anyone even looking at any of these? So thank you. Um, you know, I was influenced at a, at a young age to be a psychiatrist. I would go with my dad to the hospital and he was working with folks in recovery. And I was so struck by the level of self-awareness and humility and spirituality that many of these folks would have. And they would come up to my dad and they would be like, you know, you changed my life, like, because of you, and then I have a job, or X, Y, and Z. And I knew that they were always being so gracious because I knew I could see how hard it was because a lot of people struggled and they sometimes weren't able to maintain sobriety, but then they would just get right back on it. And I became interested in addiction and just in mental health and would go with him to meetings and 12-step meetings. And my dad would always have books on recovery, the 12 step, the Hazelden series, a book called the daily meditation for women. I still have it. It is mm -hmm. so old. It is falling <laughs> apart, but they were 365, like just beautiful quotes and passages. And all of it was just about like acceptance of your failures or imperfections, but also really courage and empowerment to change and to heal. And that was just so beautiful. And the first step is just, you know, admitting that you're powerless over something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we can't change anything in our lives if we don't have that acceptance and that self-awareness. And that is a starting point. And I feel like that's something that came maybe a little bit easier for me because I also grew up in an Eastern household where acceptance is a big part because people didn't really have a lot of control over their environment. And then I contended with the Western part, which is, you know, go, 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 do, 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 and you can do anything, but sometimes we can't. And so that duality has always stayed with me and intrigued me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is such a misconception about sobriety, recovery in general, and that it's simply about how not to drink and how not to use. And I always say, no, it's about how to live and not only just how to live, but how to live life on life's terms. And when I was, you know, kind of deep diving <laughs> through your work, a lot of what you talked about was kind of resiliency and this ability to, you know, be flexible and accept and all of that um, because life gets lifey. Like, yes, I always <laughs> say that sometimes people ask, how are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. Life is lifing right now. Like it just is. Totally. But we're so resistant to anything that you know deviates from how we think we should be yes. feeling and and what should be happening and i know that so many people have an issue with acceptance and i'm sure you can speak to this because they feel like it's just relinquishing yes. control absolutely and and that there's some perception of weakness right, right. Like if you're like i just have to accept it like what i'm going to become like a lazy bum and i'm just mm -hmm. going to sit on the couch and i want to say absolutely not like acceptance is one of the key steps in self-compassion like when we think of self-compassion and people are like what is that and i'm like mm -hmm. it's not woo woo there's a lot mm -hmm. of data like in parents who are struggling to raise kids who are having problems whether it's moms who are beating themselves up um, whether it's someone who had a setback at work or failed an exam self-compassion says first of all be mindful of these negative thoughts that you're berating yourself accept that they exist and then also embrace this idea of common humanity is that we all struggle. And what self-compassion does is it gives you a road forward. It doesn't help you wallow in your self-pity and your shame. And studies show that people who experience a lot of shame are more prone to depression and in some severe cases, even suicide. On the other hand, self-compassion says, all right, you messed up. It's totally cool. We all do it. Now what? And the resilience comes in the now what part of giving yourself an action plan to sit, wallow, cry, talk, vent, journal, do all of that. And then when you're ready, create an action plan. And that's really what a lot of the, the literature on addiction and recovery taught me is to be kind to yourself. And mm -hmm. I learned that and that was so beautiful and not something talked enough about in, in traditional Western medicine and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. 
How can people cultivate that self-compassion? Because I know that whenever I do Q&As for solo episodes or anything like that on Instagram, so many of the messages that people send in are how to overcome negative Mm self-talk. And, you know, it's so easy to be compassionate with other people Mm -hmm. and so hard to be compassionate with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I never know, like, what advice to give people, you Mm -hmm. know, for how to be nicer to yourself. Yes. And, you know, I learned this, unfortunately, the hard way. And in um, as when I was a resident in psychiatry training, we were all encouraged to go to our own therapy. And I was working 100 hours a week. And I'm like traveling between four to five different hospitals all over the city. And I was like, I just don't have time for this. This is a luxury. It's very expensive. How and when would I fit this in? And I always say, like, if you don't take care of your wellness, it will become your illness. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me. My mom was in the midst of um, getting diagnosed for stage three breast cancer. And um, she couldn't get chemo because of underlying heart disease. And um, I started having symptoms because I was like, I'm running around helping my patients. I'm running around trying to help my mom. And, and I can't manage it all, but I couldn't ask for help. And I started berating myself. And then it came out in the form of physical symptoms, leg weakness, mm. headaches. And so I then became a therapist ready for my own therapy. And when I went, it was cognitive behavioral therapy. And I just, I always say like, is it a coincidence or is it synchronicity? What's going on? Because in the midst of my experience, uh, someone came to give us a lecture on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was like, this is amazing, actionable change skills. I can, I can actually do something. I'm not just going to wallow in this. And so that is now the therapy that I practice with my patients. And we talk about cognitive distortions. So the key when, when you're feeling something, having something negative, um, I write about this in my book, Practical Optimism, is name it, claim it, tame it, and reframe it. Hmm. And what I mean by that is like, let's say you um, applied for a job and you didn't get the promotion at your current job. And you don't understand why, but suddenly you're like, I don't know, I'm having trouble sleeping, I'm going to the bathroom a lot, I'm having headaches. And so I would say, this is a sign of like, you know, the body expressing what the mind cannot. And you're probably absorbing a lot of negative thoughts about yourself. So I want you to like, figure out the trigger. And the trigger is, if you, the, the better you can point, the more granular you are with the incidents that led up to this like emotional breakdown, if you will, mm-hmm. or expression, the better off you are. And so write it in a journal. Like, I didn't get the promotion that I tried so hard that I've been working for, or I got a bad review, or like fill in the blank with whatever life's disappointments or grievances. And then claim it. Where in the body are you feeling it? You know, because we're often physical, having physical ma- manifestations. Mm-hmm. Um, are you tight in the shoulders? Are you clenching your fists? Are you clenching your jaw? Are you having a headache? And then tame it. And this can really be any number of techniques that we use. One of them is um, something called progressive muscle relaxation, where you're closing your eyes and you're clenching muscle group by muscle group and then releasing it. So you're clenching your fists, you're tightening your shoulders and then releasing and what I this love doing that. Have you done that? Are you doing <laughs> yeah, that? My like? therapist lets me do it. I love it. Yeah. Love it. And so then you, f- you feel the tension and then you feel the relaxation. Mm-hmm. And while that's not going to get at the negative thoughts, it gives you another modality in which to express yourself. Mm-hmm. Walking r- shuts down rumination because of optic flow. This idea oh. that like you have to look left and right, left and right, especially in New York City when you're here. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you're not going to get hit by a car. But that takes you out of your rumination because the default mode network in the brain mm-hmm. is what happens gets activated when we're when we're um, obsessing over something mm-hmm. and then the reframing is the best part of it and this is my favorite as someone who used to work with trauma survivors um, I've, I've learned that um, if you if you can ask yourself what would I tell myself or how am I going to feel about this five years from now is this going to matter what would I tell a friend? And to your point that we're more compassionate with our friends than we are with ourselves. Mm -hmm. What's the cost benefit of me thinking this way? And then separating productive worry from unproductive worry. So the unproductive worry is your wheels spinning in the mud, no formal action, you're not accelerating. Mm -hmm. And productive worry is what what actionable items can I take from this? Mm -hmm. So there's so many ways and there's a list of cognitive distortions like in a lot of CBT books and in my book about what you can do, what are the common distortions? Catastrophizing, fortune telling, mind reading, jumping to conclusions, minimizing. <laughs> You're saying, yeah, you've been there, right? Sound familiar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, a w- then there's like a list of techniques that a person can do to reframe those negative thoughts or to challenge them. And you know, mm-hmm. look, there's not, it's not always gonna work for everyone because in the midst of the acuity, you're like, F this, like I can't. 
I'm, yeah. I'm too, th- I'm in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. And that's okay too. Take a break, take a nap, cry. Mm-hmm. Crying always helps me relieve mm-hmm. my, my tension. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could cry more because then I'd feel like more, I always feel relieved if and when I do. Yeah, God, there's so much there. First of all, the walking thing. I remember I had Dr. Samantha Boardman on, I don't know if you know her, years ago. And I remembered she was talking about walking disrupting rumination but I never knew why Mm -hmm. and I was thinking of something else I went through a kind of brief phase where I was like so afraid of flying suddenly out of nowhere and I overcame it but something that somebody said to do was to pass something back and forth between your hands and just follow it with your eyes and I never really got an explanation (laughs) but it actually worked and I wonder if it's a similar mechanism as yes that. yes probably and like the whole idea of like emdr mm-hmm. it came from that oh yeah yeah okay the yeah, idea of opt- optic flow uh-huh. and really it's kind of like rewriting the script in some ways right. through some form of distraction that mm-hmm. takes you out of your mind and a mm-hmm. big one for me is all always this concept of awe mm-hmm. so you know when, wherever you feel small in this world and i don't mean small as in like insecure and insignificant and like a loser i mean small as in like just part of something bigger mm-hmm. and living in la you probably have plenty of opportunity for Mm -hmm. mountain hikes and all of that so whether it's the ocean for me it's swimming in the ocean or a museum architecture or nature like being in the forest even sitting by a park bench like they they found that people who can um, sit in nature two hours a week it doesn't sit or walk or what a hike whatever doesn't have to be continuous it can mean 20 minute increments and it can even be a city park bench Mm -hmm. have less anxiety less depression Mm -hmm. lower heart rate lower blood pressure so I feel like there's multitude of techniques that are within our grasp that are so easy to do that Mm -hmm. can boost our mood and decrease anxiety Mm -hmm. yeah i mean the key one in recovery is calling somebody else and asking them about themselves and not talking about yourself and usually somebody who's like newly in recovery because it you stop thinking about yourself it's you know self-abandonment in Mm -hmm. some sense which is what drugs and alcohol did too Mm -hmm. um interesting and then it kind of gives you that perspective because you're ruminating about your problems and this that and the other and and then you talk to somebody who's you know nine days sober (laughs) and you hear about what's going on with them and suddenly you know your problems don't seem that bad yes that's like my go-to and also because you're helping right and then that sense of purpose like we know this hands down that like even when adolescents are volunteering let's say with like little kids to Mm -hmm. helping them do their homework they have less inflammation in the body and less heart disease later on in life and people Mm -hmm. who volunteer have a greater sense of purpose they also Mm -hmm. like live longer and all these benefits so it takes you out of your own head Mm -hmm. and then you feel useful and I think that's a big part of it yeah for sure. And I mean, I could go off in a whole tangent about recovery, <laughs> which I will try to refrain from doing in this episode. But, you know, all of those things, purpose, feeling useful, those were not feelings that I had prior to getting sober. And I think in some sense that really fueled the addiction because I know for myself, I was trying to fill some kind of void that I wasn't able to fill. So, I, but I was trying with drugs and alcohol. And then when I got sober, that void was filled with feeling useful even if it's just to somebody else who's struggling you know Mm -hmm. and feeling like okay this is my purpose like regardless of my career regardless of whatever else is going on in my life I have this purpose where like I know that I can talk to somebody else who's struggling and tell Mm -hmm. them I've been there and like how can I help amazing Um, that's so amazing I mean your journey is so amazing and I think it's so much credit to you because it's not easy yeah thank you well you were talking a little bit about trauma and I know that when you first started out you were working with people who had been affected by 9-11 right yes so can you talk about that a little bit and how people differed in their response to that because you know so many people had this kind of universal experience yes um with you know some different variables but some people I feel like would be completely you know flatlined by that whereas Mm -hmm. other people were able to kind of brush themselves off and move on so yes can you talk about why we react differently to yes. similar traumas yes so you know there's so many factors sometimes that are beyond our control like past history of psychiatric illness like in yourself in your family past history of trauma um how medically injured you were so people who had more injuries physical and more like wounds that they had to recover from Um, it was harder and they were more likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety or depression if you lost a loved one that day. So all of these things, depending on what the problems that you had come into the situation with or how deeply devastated and how deeply affected you were. So we know that like after Hurricane Katrina, if you lost your home, if you lost your finances, 
Um, so loss of limb, life, finances, all of that makes it that much harder for recovery. But that doesn't mean that there's, there's not hope, right? It just means that you might be more predisposed for any number of reasons to have more problems. But what I found interestingly was and how I got in, interested in the idea of optimism was actually through resilience because I was like, what is it about some of these folks and that, that helps them be so resilient? they would come in for screening. So if you were living downtown or you were working downtown or in somehow your life was impacted, you could come to the program and be monitored. And um, everyone got physical health screenings, everyone got mental health screenings. But if you didn't screen positive for anxiety, depression, substance, post-traumatic stress disorder, you would never be part of our clinic. We would never see you again unless a doctor said, you know, a doctor in another area like um, internal medicine, like they, we were all in the same hallway the allergist, the, you know, the sinus doctor, the allergy doctor, everybody with GI. And so I would follow these people that didn't come into my program, but I would see them in the hallways. And there was one woman in particular that I'll never forget. And she was in her like 60s, late 60s, early 70s. And she was always smiling and she was there like almost every day. And I was like, what's going on? You don't have an appointment. What are you doing here? And she's like, oh, no, like and I would practice my Spanish. And she's like, no, I'm here to accompany so and so to their meet their appointments. And later on, I realized that her sense of purpose and that's what she said to me, me mm. proposito. And I was like, I was like, Cause what keeps you smiling? And she's like, my purpose, my purpose is to help because a lot of times people were after the trauma couldn't take subways or buses by themselves right. they had agoraphobia they had panic disorder and they would need someone to accompany them and they would avoid coming to the city at all costs if they lived outside so i realized this woman um was kept afloat because she wasn't focusing on herself and she was giving back to the community and mm -hmm. altruism is a huge part of resilience and so is optimism and so then i was like oh my god like there are things that we can do um to make us more buoyant and i was like but for so many years, I thought optimism was something just like resilience that you're either born with or not. And if you're not, then you're kind of screwed. And then I, I learned like, oh, my God, I was wrong. Like there are things you can do to boost both. Mm -hmm. And the statistic is 25 percent of it is genetic. Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I, like some of us naturally have a tendency to see the glass half half full mm -hmm. and some of us see it half empty. And mm -hmm we always just thought if you you're either one way or the other and then some years later i learned that researchers had found that there were genes associated with this um with optimism it's called the oxytocin receptor gene and oxytocin is responsible for the cuddle hormone bonding between mother and baby friends um during sex and orgasm and that depending on which variation of the gene you had you were going to be either optimistic and um less likely to have depression or pessimistic and more likely and what they found is like I was like okay cool so there's a genetic component but the genetics is only 25 percent so what about the 75 percent and then I learned that that 75 percent that is 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 like learnable and based on your psychological resources your ability to cope like coping skills asking for social support so I was like oh my god you can turn yourself into an optimist mm -hmm. by doing things that optimists do. And mm -hmm. so like from that point on, my focus began, beca you know, shifted to not just treating illness, but preventing it by boosting, helping people boost their own levels of optimism. Mm -hmm. Why don't we define optimism? Mm -hmm. Because I feel like optimism kind of gets a bad rap sometimes yes. or people think that it's, you know, just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Woo -woo. Uh, Toxic positivity? No. Toxic positivity, yes. yes. Totally. Yeah. So toxic positivity is telling someone like, everything will be fine, mm -hmm. just look on the bright side, without actually understanding and appreciating what they have been through. And it's invalidating. And you're, you're, you're shutting down conversation rather than inviting it. Optimism, and specifically practical optimism, says, I see you, I hear you, I understand what you've been through, and I'm so sorry. And it just sits with you for a minute and it says now let's begin right and it says that it's not just po practical optimism is not just a positive outlook it gives you the skills to turn a positive outlook into a positive outcome hmm. because it's an action set a skill set a tool set in addition to a mindset mm -hmm. so it says great you look at the glass half full that's nice a lot of people do and guess what 
it doesn't always land them in the best place because if you're an, an extreme optimist, a toxic optimist, you'll be like, everything will be fine. I don't need mm -hmm. to go to medical checkup. It's all good. It'll work out. Like mm -hmm. how many of us have relatives who never see their annual physician for screenings, colonoscopies, mammograms, because they think everything will be fine. Or mm -hmm. the doctor's like, hey, you got some issues with diabetes, cholesterol, maybe, you know, borderline heart disease, maybe. And the optimist is like, no, nah, no, nah, it's all good. I don't need your, I don't need your meds. I'll be fine. It'll mm -hmm. all work out. And that's called the ostrich effect. The ostrich effect is you're burying your head in the sand <laughs> and you're just hoping things will disappear and naturally work themselves out. Mm -hmm. Practical optimists don't. They take the information and then they get themselves educated. They ask for help and then they follow through with treatment plans. Mm -hmm. And we know that optimists on average, optimists and practical optimists on average live 15, 20% longer and they enjoy what we call exceptional longevity. So not only are they living longer, but they're living longer in good health. Mm -hmm. And that's not something we're seeing in this country. M many of us, where, where our lifespans are increasing, but our health span, the years spent in good health, has actually stayed the same in the last three to four decades. Interesting. And what good is that to be the spend the, the, the last 10, 15 years of your life yeah. dependent, immobile, with dementia? Yeah. I've heard you talking about an emotional immune system. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> um, so I have not, you know, that was almost going to be the title of my book like oh. <laughs> 15 years ago. I was uh -huh. like, oh, I want to write a book and I took a class on a book proposal and nothing happened with it. <laughs> but, but, you know, to me, that's what, it's the buffer, right? Yeah. So just the way our skin is a protectant and a barrier, just the way, you know, the cilia in our nose and our white blood cells and all of this is like there to like, catch any infection and prevent it from ruining us our ability to regulate our mood regulate our emotions our friendships our tight-knit community having mentorship having bonds all of these things like protect and buffer so stress by itself it has such a negative rap because we think of stress and we automatically think bad mm -hmm. and really it's not there's two types of stress you stress eu stress the word EU and, the, and then stress as one word and then distress and you stress is all the good stuff like you're planning a reunion with your family you're planning a wedding you're having a baby things you wanted you mm -hmm. asked for you <laughs> worked for but pile them on mm -hmm. versus the distress is I've got too many things even if they're all good but I can't manage them or bad things or things you haven't cho chosen mm -hmm. so stress inherently is not good or bad it depends on what you bring to the table and do you have the coping skills to manage what is being thrown at you? And that match between outside world demands and inner coping skills is what de de decides which way the scale will tip. Mm -hmm. And the, your, your emotional immune system regulates and puts you in the best possible position to handle what comes at you. And one part of that could be sleep. So if I only got you know f four hours of sleep, I'm going to be a bitch the next day. Same. <laughs> I'm, I unravel like every area of my life. Totally. <laughs> Unravels. Totally. Yes. So, you know, something as simple as getting a good night's sleep. Like for me, things that I am grappling with, like looking for solutions, looking for answers, they suddenly become clear the next morning, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. I become more creative and all of us. So, you know, last night, like someone had asked me to participate in something and I was so excited. I said yes. And then mm -hmm. by the end, at like one in the morning, I'm still <gasps> up. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh. I, I was like, I can't do it. I'm just going <laughs> to say no tomorrow. And then this morning I woke up and I was like, I have a creative solution that'll be win win where it allows me to help the person out and participate um, in, in a sort of meaningful way without mm -hmm. being, a, you know, great inconvenience mm -hmm. to myself. Oh, my gosh. I just got anxiety at the 1 a.m. Because <laughs> I'm that same way. And you were saying, like, if you get a good night's sleep, you wake up and suddenly everything is clear. Well, conversely, at least for me, if I don't get a good night's sleep, everything feels so magnified. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if I'm tired. Yes. Like, because the thing is, if you, you're, like, successful, high-achieving person, and when you are, you want to be able to um, troubleshoot. Mm. And you want to find solutions. And you're quick. And you have... A, this amazing business like you need to move forward you, mm -hmm. you can't afford to lose time and when we're tired our like decision fatigue is in full force yeah and so you're like I can't make st like I don't know I'm yeah. paralyzed yeah and so it's okay like in those moments to be like you know what I'm going to regroup I don't I'm going to hit pause like mm -hmm. not stop and then come back and in for some people it may be more than just a, a, a lack of sleep they may not be 
they might be in the midst of a depression mm -hmm. and executive functioning is impacted co cognition memory concentration um so that that's also challenging i see sometimes like really smart people are like i can't i just mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. i can't life lifing life yeah. <laughs> life is lifey <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah i get that well we all go through our phases yes right yes um Okay, so you have eight pillars, right, mm -hmm. of optimism. Maybe we can go through them. Yes. Um, because I think that will be helpful for the listener. I love that you're saying, you know, it's not just a mindset, because I think that especially on social media, everything is change your mindset and mindset motivation. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, okay, how do I change yes. my mindset? And then what? Yes. I like that you say that, no, it's a skill set. It's an action set. You know, you take it further. Yes. Um, so what are these pillars and how can people implement them into their life to you know make them actionable yes and the first thing I always like to say is just like if you're in therapy like please continue if it's mm -hmm. helping like this is not going to replace the mm -hmm. individualized care and treatment that a person will get in their own therapy but it certainly can be used in conjunction um, I like to use that as maintenance prevention and even if you're like I'm doing totally fine I've, I, I think of this as um, helping you be your best self mm -hmm. so I start with purpose and these chapters are written or these eight principles they start out with having a purpose as an intention and they end at their eight P's and they end at practicing healthy habits and so purpose is about intention and goal and it can be big P as in capital P of life what is my purpose in life but it could mm -hmm. be small purpose what is my purpose in this relationship in this moment in this transaction in this event um, so getting very clear about w what you're intending to do and also recognizing that your purpose today may not be your purpose five years ago and may not be your purpose five years from now. The other thing is that your purpose doesn't have to be connected to your paycheck, right? So when you talk about like you get so much like benefit from mentoring other people and helping other people, that could be something you do f to fulfill you. It may mm -hmm. not be your day job, but if your day job also happens to have a paycheck and a purpose that's amazing mm -hmm. and sometimes i say if you have a hard time finding your purpose it's your job to create it because some people will be like i feel lost like i don't know what i'm called to do mm -hmm. and then i say put the cart before the horse and it's a tip called behavioral activation from cbt that is used in people when they're depressed when they're languishing when they're like i'm not have i'm not feeling motivation it's okay cart before the horse motivation will come because that's the beauty is that purpose begets more purpose mm -hmm. you know and you're like listening to a podcast you're like oh my god i am inspired now to go to a networking event right and mm -hmm. um so even if you don't feel like it if you think that there will be benefit in it right whether it's reaching out i made so many good friends and connections on instagram we met that way like mm -hmm. so i'm just so happy that we have access and we have resources and activity planning is a big tip like to populate your calendar with mm -hmm. meaningful activities that mm -hmm. give you pleasure and give you joy. And if you're just really stuck, ask yourself one simple question. What activity brings you joy and when's the last time that you did it? Because a lot of times people will say like, I don't feel connected. The mm -hmm. other thing hack is exercise gives you a sense of purpose. So mm -hmm. if you are lost and not feeling motivated, get up and go for a walk around the block if that's all you can do. And then if you wanna go to the gym, you wanna do weight training, great. All of that builds a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm the next one is processing emotions so this is where so much so many of us stuff our emotions and you talk about that right mm -hmm. like how we cope in different ways and um being able to access them and using them as information right like separate emotions from facts so many of us get into our head because there's something called emotional reasoning Mm -hmm. I feel it, therefore it is. Yes. I feel like a loser. <laughs> I feel like no one likes me. I feel fat. I feel whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, simple question, what is the evidence to suggest this? Mm -hmm. And one thing I find an, an emotion that's really hard for a lot of women to experience and fully embrace is anger. And different people deal with anger differently. A lot of my patients will say, I, I cry. I don't get angry. That's what happens. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's an, I want women to sort of lean into that. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to say that a lot of times people will say, well, it's easy to be optimistic when everything is working out for you in your life, right? There's so many disparities, like there's so many unfair things. And I hear you. And I'm not saying, you know, if you're in part of the world that doesn't give you an opportunity or that discriminates or racism or bias, like for sure, right? It's hard to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. But even still, I would say practical optimism is the way to go because yeah. it says, you know, to the, to the people who are being unfair with you, I see you, I know what you're doing. 
but I'm not, that's not going to stop me. Like I've right. had people who didn't, never believed in me, who didn't think that, that I would amount to anything. And I'm like, I see you, but that's not going to stop me. Like mm-hmm. I have vision, I have mission, I have purpose. And when you have that behind you, especially when what you're doing is for the greater good of a community, a society, a person, I feel like you're, you're called by something so much higher than yourself, whatever you want that to be, if it's a higher power, if it's the universe, that no one can stop you, mm-hmm. you know? And there was a phrase that my parents would always say, you know, in moments of struggle in my life, that they were like, don't worry, the universe will conspire to help you. Yes. So yeah, you know, I love that. <laughs> so it makes me feel like we're not alone, right? Yeah. Like, and it, the doors will open, people will be put in your place, conversations, opportunities. Of course, you have to do your part to make them available to you. Mm-hmm. So processing is all about self-awareness and mindfulness and un- sitting with feelings. Journaling is, is one way. There's so mm-hmm. much research on journaling, 15 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. It quickens wound healing after surgery. It Wow. Yes. <laughs> after a biopsy, people who journal more often, they heal faster. Less colds and infections and flus per year. Less heart attacks. So wow. it, it is like... I, like I went into so much science in, in doing the research for this book and even though I'm a clinician and I've practiced for 20 years I've gone to medical school and residency I was like I don't want any claim in this book to go without being cited and sourced so mm-hmm. I like did all of this so that you don't have to struggle and suffer or do the research yourself it's all there and the citations I have them on my website as well I want to rewind a little bit to that one yes yeah. how is it that that is so transformative and healing is it because we're getting that stuff out Mm -hmm. of our head and therefore out of our bodies essentially yes Yes. and you know when you're putting like you're you're parking it in the journal and I and I can speak Mm. so strongly about it not only because the science but because it has been so effective for me in my life like when I'm caught up in a loop and when I see this with my patients it's you're you're on that cycle and you can't get off like Mm -hmm. the hamster on the wheel that's like get me off of this you're not even aware that you're on this hamster wheel and it's almost like someone's got to knock you off, like fling you off that hamster wheel. And mm-hmm. the journal, uh, the journaling gives you a place to park your emotions, to create distance, to create separation. And I think what this does in the bottom body is we know that long term, like the fight and flight response is very effective when a bear is chasing you in the forest. Mm-hmm. Aside from that, like if you're not in acute danger and 90 percent of the time, we're not in acute danger, mm-hmm. except our body perceives that we are being chased metaphorically by the bears of society. Those bears right. could be like competition, need to succeed, need to look a certain way, sound a certain way, need to have a certain bank account, whatever it might be. So the cortisol is wreaking havoc. It causes so much inflammation. And so if you want to look younger, feel younger, be younger, stress management is first and foremost. So you mm-hmm. can be in the gym a million hours a week and obviously watch what you eat and that will help you Mm -hmm. but when we talk about longevity and lifespan and health span it's specifically stress management and distress tolerance is a big part of that Mm -hmm. another reason why people in recovery look so young (laughs) yeah (laughs) probably (laughs) one they're not drinking and doing drugs but also you know yes have this um this modality to deal with stressors as they come and you know be flexible in life (laughs) and i think that's such a big thing like a lot of times we have to struggle and suffer to get to that rock bottom to then rebuild with Mm -hmm. a healthier it's kind of like rebuilding a house let's say the house was i hate to say this cheaply made or poorly made Mm -hmm. or had didn't have a great foundation depending on our childhood depending on what our parents went through how how available they were how nurturing and emotionally available what skills they had what emotional intelligence they had how much nurturing they gave us what their trauma and stress and intergenerationally what they brought most of us aren't going to be raised with having language and self-compassion and kindness. So it often does take a breakdown to have the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And most of the patients that have come to me, when they left, I feel like I'm not privy to what their life was before. But when they come and they say, you know what, I want to go back to my baseline. I was like, let's think about that for a minute because your baseline is what got you here Mm -hmm. in the first place yeah so i don't know if you want to go back to that (laughs) yeah and so i tell them like what i see my job is a co-conspirator in your life to to be a part of your journey is to not just take you from dysfunctional to functional it's to take you from functional to optimal Mm -hmm. and that's more than they bargain for because most of the times when you see a doctor they're like okay you have a broken arm let's fix it no one's like oh let's help you with your backhand yeah like that's not my job (laughs) yeah go to your coach (laughs) yeah go to your trainer yeah interesting okay third one yeah i think we're on third yeah okay so problem solving and problem solving you know one of the things that i learned from my parents they would say this to me this is where the eastern wisdom would come in 
is this a problem to be solved or a truth to be accepted? And that was so freeing for me because so often like, you know, being born and raised in the United States, I'm just like, let's do, we can do anything we want. And my parents would be like, great, good for you. Happy, to, happy that you have that, except where are the obstacles? What mm -hmm. are the challenges? Like, mm -hmm. so, so let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves and not to discourage you from solving your problems, but just to understand that sometimes there's nothing you can solve your way out of. If mm -hmm. someone you love is no longer available to you for any number of reasons, they passed, whatever it is they broke up with you they mm -hmm. ghosted you um a friendship that died right so like there are some things that are so hard for us to accept that some that it, something is no longer and we don't have access to it so mm -hmm. that's the first question and then when you do try to solve the problem understand that you're always contending with the battle on two fronts one is out there in the real world mm -hmm. so that's where troubleshooting and looking at the obstacles and i have like a set of questions that you can ask yourself um a punch list 25 questions it could be 10 if you want but then you're also dealing with the battle in your head and that's where emotional regulation comes in mm -hmm. and there's a technique that i like that is you know looking at the triggers then looking at the negative thoughts and this is from cbt and then how do you challenge those negative thoughts so mm -hmm. emotional regulation is a big part of problem solving but then there's also the concrete stuff in the world like how do i maneuver when you want something and you can see your endpoint you know where you want to be and you're like oh there's a bunch of st it's like an obstacle course yeah that you have to work your way around it mm -hmm. and i always believe like if if you can't if plan a doesn't work like the front door try the back door try yeah. the sound door yeah. try every door yes the next one is pride mm -hmm. and people always think of like pride with like associated with like arrogance and and it's not it's really rooted in self-compassion mm -hmm. and saying to yourself where when i'm beating myself up where are these shoulds you you started out by talking about shoulds where do they come from because i think mm -hmm. we so um w willingly accept other people's expectations of us from such a young age i need as a woman need to be young i need to be thin i need to be pretty i and i need to be productive and i need to be a good friend and i need to be a good partner and i need to prioritize everyone else they should feel loved by me i should be charismatic i should be exciting and it's like the list of shoulds of what <laughs> women are supposed to be are endless, you know? And then when you have a child, I need to be the best, most self-sacrificial woman, but also be super fit and also make them gluten-free pancakes and yeah. bento boxes. And it's yeah. like, where do you fit into all of this, right? right? And these shoulds will drive us crazy. And there's um, a saying, um, Albert Ellis would, would talk about like, shooting on yourself like mm -hmm. shitting on yourself mm -hmm. and like he would talk about must and masturbation it's like enough <laughs> enough of like the musts and the shoulds and you're mm -hmm. driving yourself nuts and i've done that and i've been there and the self-compassion taught me you're not saying me first you're saying me too i deserve at the seat at the table mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and um and i will create a seat or ask for someone to help you put one there for you mm -hmm. um the next one is proficiency and what i love about this is that our proficiency is our self-efficacy and it's not it's great that if you have an ability but you must also have confidence in your ability and our confidence in our abilities often predicts success interesting more so <laughs> than the actual ability and wow. i'm not telling people to fake it and pretend you have talent when you don't because mm -hmm. eventually you will be found out and it won't be <laughs> helpful but if you have the ability to then also believe like they would they've done competition they've done like experiments where an athlete was told this person is better than you and meanwhile they weren't but they t were told that you have no chance and clearly the the person failed mm -hmm. when they were told this person the uh, the person that you're against knows nothing about what they're doing just that ability just the confidence in your ability that i have the chance to beat this person you were more likely to beat them because you thought so wow so as much as possible self-efficacy and proficiency is built from doing things yourself if mm -hmm. you can't mentorship live feedback with trusted group of advisors mm -hmm. um so have like a board of trustees in your life that you like mm -hmm. advisors I that you turn that. to uh -huh. um, and then the next one is being present and when you were talking about monkey mind <laughs> it's so like literally a, a monkey's trying to grasp this branch and that branch and i yeah. use this example of like airport baggage carousel 
to be aware of other people's baggage, but you never go home with it, right, at the mm -hmm. airport. You're like, that's an ugly bag, that's a cute bag, <laughs> but you leave them there. So leave the thoughts there. And I love that you, you, you have a meditation practice. And that's what practical optimism is. It is a practice. And mm -hmm. like learning a language, a yoga, a sport, whatever you might do. The next one, and my favorite P, is people. I love people. <laughs> and the key here is to go deep and to be emotionally attuned to people. So there's two things. There's three things, actually. Developing an aloneness practice and learning to enjoy your own company mm -hmm. is a big part of it and spending time with yourself alone. People hate spending time alone. I've heard you talk about this before and I'm like, I cannot relate. I <laughs> love being alone. I travel alone. I love I'm that. traveling alone after this. Like I and people will send me messages and things, you know, strangers always and say, Oh, it's so like lonely. Why do you and I'm like, No, if you don't love your own company first like yes what are you doing yes that's so beautiful you <laughs> yeah. know and i feel like the best the healthiest relationships of whether they're friendships or partnerships are built when we're not escaping mm -hmm. ourselves and we're yeah. not looking to um because a lot of times people will in some experiments like they'll they would rather shock themselves give oh themselves gosh. a small electric <laughs> shock than to sit there alone wow and i know people who will have noise like a tv or like noise going on in the shower when they sleep at night because mm. they don't want to feel alone mm -hmm. so developing an aloneness practice which it sounds like it comes easy for you which is something that all of us should really mm -hmm. work towards the second is um the social snacking or micro connections with people that's mm. also really important because mm -hmm. um you so many layers of built-in connection exist your barista dog walker doorman in the building mm -hmm. that they were lost during the pandemic and i feel like because we're always shopping online we're not interacting with people as much so mm -hmm. looking for opportunities to smile to make eye contact and to make small talk if needed mm -hmm. um, then the emotional attunement and meaningful connections meaningful engagement and this is going deeper and i feel like a lot of times this is what's being lost in society is that people are talking but it's on a very superficial level yeah. no one is having the deep what i learned about you today it was so beautiful but <laughs> it's authentic mm -hmm. and it's real and when two, when one person opens up about themselves it puts the other person at ease and mm -hmm. it's like i can drop my mask and yes. i don't need to maintain my front and yeah. just because now you've shared you've invited me as a result to feel comfortable with you to share and mm -hmm. i feel like whenever appropriate when it's the right time the right place to be able to ask like i'd like to vent is it okay you know and then to vent and then the other person for them to listen and to validate and to empathize and to off offer support mm -hmm. and then to people to say what I'm hearing is and I'm sorry you right. know I'm sorry that you're feeling this way and we don't need to interject we don't need to give advice unless someone is asking but we know that people who have active listeners in their life will live four years longer than wow. other people. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. These statistics are so fascinating to me. Like, how did they do these studies? You yes. know? Yes. I mean, they had to have been like decades yes. long. Yes. Yes. And then and then there's so many tips about how to make, maintain deep friendships. Um, and then the last one is practicing healthy habits. And mm. this is so fascinating to me because, you know, I did a lot of research on longevity and the medical aspect of optimism and how it's being used as, as an intervention in surgery in immunology and it's such a well-kept secret i mm -hmm. think or, and it should be out there and hopefully it will be after this but um and and the four m's of mental health which is something that i practice every day that it's an easy habit that people can learn and start doing as soon as they listen to this and it's um four mental health habits for exceptional wellness it's mindfulness mastery meaningful engagement and movement mm. and so 10 to 15 minutes of whatever feels right to you if you want to do more but i would say try to figure out some way that they can fit in your calendar every day mm -hmm. what's an example of mastery so m with mastery you don't have to be a master to experience mastery mm -hmm. and um in the in, in the beginning of january i was interviewed by the new york times and they said we want some tips to get more energy so they mm -hmm. called this it was the uh, New York Times Energy Challenge, well, ch the well mm -hmm. section, and it was a no n uh, low stakes flow state. And flow is one way to experience mastery when you're mm -hmm. so immersed in something and you want to get better. And mm -hmm. so they were like, what do you do? And I'm like, 
I, I tried a salsa dance. Try the keyword. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel a sense, it, like, am I a master? Hell no. Mm -hmm. Right? But I feel a sense of mastery in that moment because yeah. I'm completely lost in what I'm doing yeah. in a good way. You're yeah. immersed in what you're doing. So for someone, it might be pottery or mm -hmm. gardening. But the point is that you're doing it for yourself mm -hmm. and for nobody else. And if, sure, if it turns out that other people are listening and watching, like, if I'm giving a talk or I'm on TV or I'm talking to you, like it's something I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of the time. Mm -hmm. So that's fine if it is going to be visible. Yeah. But as much as possible, do it just for yourself and no one else mm -hmm. because you want to learn, because you want to get better. There's something really key about the flow state of learning. And it's the sweet spot where you're learning. You're not very you're not excellent at it, but you're good enough to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's also a way to not be on your phone. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> I feel like that is such a problem now. I mean, talk about not being able to be alone with yourself. And I fall into this habit too, just totally. picking up my phone in any dead space that I have in my day. So I love the idea of like having something. I know pottery is huge right now in LA. Yes. I don't know if it's having a moment here too. But it. What do you um, like to do for fun? To I like playing piano. Nice. Um, something that like I took lessons when I was younger and you know I'm not great but I can teach myself things um, just by watching YouTube or just listening to things and kind of playing by ear. That's awesome. So that's something that I love to do. I love playing tennis again like not great but it's fun good for you it's really fun great so and I want to try pottery I have a friend that does it <laughs> <laughs> he's he got really good so that's going to be my next that's beautiful thing. Yeah. that's so beautiful and you're right because and if you can do it with a friend even better because then you're like yeah. checking a couple of boxes off yes. right like you've yeah, got you're meaningful getting, engagement yeah. you're meeting people your mastery mm -hmm. and there's mindfulness involved mm -hmm. and like maybe if you walk to the class there's movement involved yeah. or jog yeah I love that. I can do that. I can walk there. So I'm going to awesome, <laughs> awesome. put that into action. Well, thank you so much. My it's pleasure. so fascinating. I can't wait to get your book because thank I you. love just the intersection of like the really sciencey stuff and, you know, the applicable stuff. And it sounds like this is something that we can all incorporate into our lives, but it has the data to back it yes. up. So I think it's amazing what you're doing. It's Thank so fun you. talking to you and tell everybody where they can find you. Thank you. So um, most active on Instagram. So Dr. Sue Varma um, and then my website, drsuvarma.com. And you can get the book Practical Optimism, Art, Science and Practice of Exceptional Well-Being <laughs> anywhere books are sold. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.